Well, good morning, church. So very good to be with you guys on this beautiful Sunday morning. Um, this morning, as was mentioned, and as has been read, and as we've been singing, we're going to be spending some time in the book of Psalms, chapter 100. So if you have a Bible, I want to encourage you to grab it and open up to Psalm 100 this morning. You know, it's the last Sunday of November. The holidays, the, the Christmas season is in full swing everywhere else but this room, it seems like, right? It's been upon us since October. Um, and, uh, but this morning, kind of before we step into a, a series of teachings, really focusing our hearts on Christmas, we'll spend a little bit of time in Psalm 100 this morning, kind of with the tone and the theme of thanksgiving. You know, last Sunday, Pastor John gave a phenomenal message on that theme and that topic from Psalm chapter 92. And if you haven't checked it out, I encourage you to find it on, on the multiple platforms we have. But today, Psalm 100. And let me just ask you to stand with me. I'd like to open this morning by reading this very short psalm, five verses, before we jump into it this morning. This morning, I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. And this is what the psalmist writes. Shout with joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him singing with joy. Acknowledge that the Lord is God and that he made us and that we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. So enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good. His unfailing love continues forever. And his faithfulness continues to each generation. Father, we thank you for your word, for the truth, the power, the impact, the meaning of your word to our hearts this morning. And God, as we fellowship together, as we sing this morning, as we pray together, as we give of our resources to your kingdom, as we learn from your word, God, may you move by your spirit and in power in our time together. Lord, bless your people as we open up your word this morning. May you speak by your spirit. Lord, we love you and pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You may be seated. We have a full calendar ahead of us this month, this coming month, the month of December. So many wonderful gatherings, different events, different things that we invite you to, the entire community to this month. The women's tea happening this weekend, the kids choir. I think they've been prepping since October for cookies in the courtyard. We've got so many different giving initiatives going on. Christmas Eve, Christmas Day. And it's good to intentionally focus time and attention together celebrating the faithfulness of God. And I say that for this reason, because I really believe that that's what the Christmas season is about. The faithfulness of God. God proving good on his promises since the beginning of creation to send his son, Jesus, as the Messiah. That's what the Christmas season is all about. Last week in our home, we even began kind of decorating a little bit for Christmas. We've watched a few movies. We've baked a few cookies. And my son recently asked, he said, Dad, is the point of Christmas family and giving gifts to one another? And I understand why he asked that, because every show that you watch, every movie that has some sort, and not all have these, but some sort of wholesome takeaway that seems to be the takeaway of Christmas. At least that's the lesson that seems to be taught to kids these days, that, that Christmas is about family. Christmas is about giving gifts to one another. Cr Christmas is about that time together. But the reality is Christmas is not about food or gifts or even the wonderful gift of family. It's partly in that, but Christmas is about God 
proving good on his promise to send Jesus as the Savior of the world. That's what Christmas is about. Fulfilling dozens upon dozens of foretellings, prophecies about his soon coming son. Let me just read like six of them to you, half a dozen. Isaiah 7:14 says that he would be born of a virgin. Micah 5:2 says that he'd be born in Bethlehem. Hosea tells us that the Messiah would spend time in Egypt, that he'd be called a Nazarene, the book of Isaiah tells us, that he would be the heir to the throne of David, and that a messenger, according to Isaiah chapter 40, verse 35, would prepare God's people for his arrival. And this is amazing because as you look at the life of Jesus, that's who he is. Fulfills prophecy after prophecy. And we celebrate that this upcoming month. In fact, our next four Sundays together here at Coastline will be all about preparing our hearts for celebrating Jesus. The hope, the faith, the love that we experience because of his arrival into our world. And it's easy to kind of lose sight of that. I mean, if you watch, if you stream a few movies with your kids, the takeaway is, man, we got to get some more decorations. This is about family. This is about gifts. It's easy to lose sight of the purpose for this season. But it's also, for our intentions this morning, it's extremely easy to lose sight of what we just did on Thursday, to, to give thanks to frame your, your attitude with gratitude has been said so often. I mean, I love the fact that we in this country have a day that's set aside to give thanks. That, that Thanksgiving, at least in some way, it's actually a noun, right? It's a holiday. It's a date on the calendar. But Thanksgiving is also something that's so active, a verb that that's directed towards God. I think that can easily be forgotten. You know, in Abraham Lincoln's 1863 Thanksgiving Day proclamation, listen to the words that he shared. He says this, I do therefore invite my fellow citizens in every part of the United States and also those who are at sea and those who are sojourning in foreign lands to set apart and observe the last Thursday of November as a day of thanksgiving and praise to our beneficent Father who dwells, he actually said dwelleth, but I'm, you know, dwells in the heavens. It's not just a day to be thankful, but a day to give thanks to God, that that's to whom it's directed. And this holiday of thanksgiving, it's a verb meaning to describe our actions, our attitude. And it's interesting, as you read through God's word, you might recognize that there's certain things that God has to, I don't know, in some way, it's almost like he has to spell it out for us in scripture. And it kind of gives us insight into the nature of humanity. Leviticus 11:16, don't eat seagulls. <laughs> Leviticus 11:19, don't eat bats, the word of God tells us. Anyone struggle this Thanksgiving with laying off the seagull souffle or the bat buffalo wings? No. I mean, that kind of stuff's like, all right, it's in there, right? But there's certain things in God's word that he seems to call his people to over and over and over and again. As I could find seagulls and bats, that's the only place it's mentioned there once. But, but this idea of giving thanks to God, you know, I find it interesting. I couldn't even discern or find a clear answer on how many times in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, God instructs his people to be thankful. But it's many, many, many times. The Bible's filled with commands. Psalm 106, 107, 118, 1 Chronicles. Filled with commands to give thanks to God. Many verses go on to give reasons why we should thank God. Psalm 136, for his love endures when the weather is good. No, his love endures forever. 
and his mercy is everlasting. It would seem that this attitude of gratitude, this dynamic of giving thanks, this mindfulness of who God is and our response to him is something that we can so easily tend to drift away from. So God often throughout his word calls us to a place of giving thanks to him. Why is that? You know, a couple things I read this week that really spoke to me about this mindset, this lifestyle, this action of thanksgiving. One author says this, gratitude is actually the soil in which joy and peace take root so that they can bear their good fruit in our lives. You know who that author is? John Spencer. He said it last Thanksgiving. I thought it was awesome. <laughs> Another person said this, gratefulness allows for us to live with resilient and sustainable joy and peace. Gratefulness is the soil Gratefulness, thankfulness is that opportunity for God to instill these fruits that many of us long for. If I could just have a sense of peace or that joy that you're reading about in Psalm chapter one, 100, shout with joy. How can that bear fruit? How can that gain root in my life? Well, the soil for it quite often is gratitude, thanksgiving, and one of the ongoing challenges in life is to see thanksgiving translate into thanks living, as it's been said. That that's the lifestyle. That's the tone. That's the heart. That's the attitude of who we are. So in light of that this morning, I'd like to consider Psalm 100 together. It's entitled, A Psalm of Thanksgiving. And as the author writes, shout with joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him singing with joy. Acknowledge that the Lord is God. He made us. We are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. So enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name for the Lord is good. His unfailing love continues forever and his faithfulness his faithfulness continues to each generation. This morning, we're going to consider a psalm of thanksgiving. And this psalm speaks of several characteristics of God's people. There's shouting in verse 1. There's service and singing in verse 2. There's submission and surrender in verse 3. And in verses 4 and 5, we see this thanksgiving. And this mindset and this place of proper thinking in verse 5. It's interesting, of all 150 psalms, the only one with the title, a psalm of thanksgiving, is Psalm 100. And it's an invitation for you and I, yes, most definitely, but for the whole world to know and to worship God. One Bible commentator put it this way, it is jubilant with confidence for the whole earth as it contemplates the glory of that earth when its people are submitted to the reign of Jehovah. Verse one, verse two, we see shouting, we see service, we see singing. Shout to the Lord all the earth, worship the Lord with gladness, come before him singing with joy. You know, it's interesting. This psalm doesn't start with a declaration of God's character, of his actions, of his sovereignty, but it's simply a direct encouragement to praise God from all nations. And this is at the very heart of the Bible. God desires for all people to come to know him. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says, He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but desires that everyone would come to repentance. Pastor Warren Wearsby says this about this passage. He says, This is a recurring theme in what's known as the Royal Psalms, this section, Psalm 97, 98, 99, 100. 
For it was Israel's responsibility to introduce the Gentiles to the true and living God. And the church, you and I, we have been commissioned to take the good news into all the world. And I love what he says here. It'll be a glorious day when God's people gather at his throne from all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues. That's what this psalm is descriptive of. And the psalmist says to shout with joy. Shout with joy. Now, the sense behind the shouting with joy, it's kind of like that idea of a, of a loyal subject with a king and queen when he or she comes into their midst. Now, I would say this. I don't know that we as maybe citizens of this country maybe have that same sense, that same understanding of shouting with joy. I mean, if I were to bring a few pictures of some of our civic leaders, we might get varying responses. So I have a few. Let's see the kind of responses we get. No, I don't have a few. <laughs> but it would be interesting. But a shout for joy. This is the mindset that, that he's writing about. It's like this old cartoon. I'm kind of dating myself with this illustration. But do you remember this? Prince John and King Richard. Man, they despise Prince John, but they're all jubilant around old King Richard. Spurgeon wrote this. He says, the original word signifies a glad, glad shout, such as loyal subjects give when their king appears. Happy, exuberant. And he writes this, our happy God should be worshiped by a happy people. A cheerful spirit is in keeping with his nature, his acts, and the gratitude which we should cherish for his mercies. You know, it's interesting that God actually sings over his people, the book of Zephaniah tells us, that he loves his people, that there's a sense of joy, and as Spurgeon would write, a happy God towards his people. And so the psalmist writes here in Psalm 100, shout with joy to the Lord. And in verse two, he says, worship the Lord with gladness. Now in other translations, that word worship can be translated as simply serving the Lord. There's this call, this responsibility for all of God's people to be engaged in a meaningful and purposeful way to advance God's kingdom to serve, to serve God's church, to serve in the community. And the point of that is to do it with gladness. Do it with a happy heart. One author says this, it's your privilege and duty to be happy in your religious worship. The religion of the true God is intended to remove, remove human misery and to make mankind happy. He whom the religion of Christ has not made happy does not understand that religion, nor does not make proper use of it. Say, so what do you mean by that? You've heard me share this alliterated example many, many times. But as Christians, we're forgiven. We're set free. We're brought into a family and we've been given a future. That shouldn't bum out our Monday. That mindset should produce within us a sense of joy. But don't you find that you have to constantly be reminded of that? As the psalmist would write here today in Psalm 100, or as God does throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, to call his people to a place of thanksgiving. Because it seems like there's something within us that drifts from that place ever so easily. We don't often have to be reminded, hey, no seagull souffles, no buffalo bat wings, right? It's just once that I can find in Leviticus. But this call to be a thankful people, to be a grateful people, to be those that would shout to the Lord, to be those that would serve with gladness, this mindset of setting yourself rightly with who you are in Christ, it's something you need to be reminded of continually. So he says... Shout with joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. And finally, in verse two, he says, sing with joy. 
And many places throughout the Psalms, you're encouraged to sing. And singing is not the only way to give praise or to give worship to God. I mean, we do that through everything of who we are, our attitudes, our choices, how, our work ethic, all those different things, worship and give praise to God. But singing, I would say, is one of the chief ways described in the Bible to come before God. I mean, if you look over at Psalm 95, he, he gives us this same encouragement. Let me read to you the first five verses of that Psalm. He says, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come to him with thanksgiving. Let us sing psalms of praise to him, for the Lord is great, a great king above all gods. He holds in his hands the depths of the earth and the mightiest mountains. The sea belongs to him, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land too. You know, most people appreciate an invitation to something, a trip, a dinner, an event. And in verse one of Psalm 95, he says, come, come, let us sing. Let us shout joyfully. Let us come to him with thanksgiving. Let us sing psalms and hymns. God is to be honored with song, and this is to be done in community, right? There's four let us's there in those two verses. God loves to be honored with a, with a happy, enthusiastic heart. I mean, there is truly a place for somber, reflective worship, but that shouldn't be the dominant tone of our worship of God because Christians, let me remind you of the four F's. You're forgiven. You're set free. You've been brought into a family. Your future is secure. And you are invited, the book of Psalms would share with us, to gather with God's people and to sing and to sing loudly with joy and gratitude to God. But admittedly, there are times where you would say, joyfully, I'm just not there. Gratitude? That's why in this Psalm 95, I think he gives us this perfect framework for our mindset. He says, for the Lord God is great God. He's a king above all gods. He holds in his hands the depths of the earth and the mightiest mountains. The sea belongs to him for he made it. His hands form the dry land too. Why do we give joyful shouts unto God. Look at who he is. Scripture informs our perspective. He's our God. He's the creator. He's, he's tough, so to speak. He's the rock of our salvation, but he's also personal. A great God, a great king above all gods. See, no matter who you run to for security, God is stronger. No matter what you run to for satisfaction, the Lord is sweeter. No matter how wise your counselor is, God is great in his wisdom. And our circumstances don't mitigate his might. Our trials, they don't diminish his deity. The problems of our world don't soften his sovereignty. And there's a tendency to see challenges inaccurately, but truly outlook determines outcome. And scripture gives us this outpost for our outlook, our perspective on life. When we see God as the creator, we have to squint at our problems. And so verses one and two of Psalm 100 they invite us, as Psalm 95 does, to shout with joy, to, to serve God with gladness, to sing with joy. And just as Psalm 95 does here in Psalm 100, he tells us why. Look at verse 3 of Psalm 100. Acknowledge that the Lord is God, that he made us, that we are his, we are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Submission 
and surrender. If the first two verses tell us to shout, to serve, to sing, well, verse 3 speaks all about submission to the Lord, surrender to him. The psalmist says to acknowledge, acknowledge. I love that the praise that God desires has an element of mindfulness to it. That praise of God begins simply but powerfully with the recognition of who he is. He's God. By acknowledging God's lordship in your life, here's the reality. You position yourself, your heart, to receive God's love, to hear his voice. But it isn't a one-time thing. You know, one author put it this way, to understand the value of surrender, you need to practice it continually. It's not enough to know about it or to agree with it intellectually. You must actually do it. Start every day by consciously surrendering your will, your mind, your heart, and emotions to God. And you will understand what it means to take delight in the Lord, as the psalmist says elsewhere. The Hebrew word translated delight means to be soft or to be pliable. And your heart will become like that and open to the voice of the Holy Spirit. God will mingle his thoughts with your thoughts in a new way. Surrendering to him daily will start the flow of the Spirit in you. See, this idea of thanksgiving, of gratitude, of singing to the Lord, serving the Lord, surrendering to the Lord, submitting to the Lord. It's not a once and done thing. It's a continual thing. It's something that throughout God's word, he calls his people to over and over and over and again, to remember who he is. I mean, do you remember from our study in the book of Revelation, the apostle John, there in chapter four, what he sees. It says in verse one of of chapter four of, of the book of Revelation that as he stood in heaven and there's a voice speaking to him like a like a trumpet blast calls him up to heaven, says, come up here. It says in verse two, instantly I was in the spirit and I saw something. A throne in heaven and someone was sitting on it. John gets called up into heaven in the most visible, the most important, the most predominant thing he sees in all of heaven is the throne of God. 46 times in the book of Revelation, the throne of God is mentioned. Why is this important? Because this is theology 101. God sits upon his throne. There is a throne in heaven, and it's not yours. Like this is the elementary, the theology 101. The simplicity that the Bible teaches us is that in the beginning, God created heaven and earth. That God is on his throne. There's a seat of authority, a seat of power, and the entire universe answers to him. And the psalmist here in Psalm 100, verse 3, says, acknowledge that the Lord is God, that he made us, that we're his, that we didn't create ourselves. Charles Spurgeon says this, for our part, we find it far more easy to believe that the Lord made us than that we were developed by a long chain of natural selections from floating atoms which fashioned themselves together. And I would hang my hat with the Prince of Preachers on that thought. That God created us. That there is a creator. That we see evidence of his creation all around us. And so the psalmist says here in Psalm 100, worship him because he's the creator. Worship him because he's God. And there's this sense of submission and surrender that comes with this recognition. But listen, there's also a tenderness to it. It's not a a fearful, anxiety-ridden, worrisome submission to an unloving, unkind, disengaged God. But in verse 3, he says, we are his people, the sheep of his pasture. 
I mean, Pastor John read from that this morning, Psalm 23. Doesn't that ring in your heart? The Lord is my shepherd. So I have everything I need. That's who he is. I don't want, I don't lack because I belong to him. I am one of his people, the sheep of his pasture. You know, as I age, at the age of 41, this is what I've found. The most inspiring people to me, the most attractive, are people that are genuine, humble people who know who they are. They don't have anything to prove, no insecurity to cover, conceal, or overcompensate for. But they know who God is. They know that he loves them, that he's got a plan for their life, that he's sovereign, that he sits upon a throne, that he's God, that you can trust him, that he's bigger than your mistakes. And this simple realization that I can have an ongoing, personal, intimate, growing relationship with God through his spirit, where God leads and I follow, where God initiates and I respond. See, no one has life all figured out. No one ever will. But God does. And he is faithful to lead us every step of the way. And knowing that God will direct us as we simply daily surrender our lives to him and develop an intimate relationship with him in life, that's what's most attractive. That's what's most impressive in life. And why does that happen? Listen, church. Because we are his people the sheep of his pasture. That, that mindset, that reality, that's something that we need to be reminded of over and over and over again, that's what leads us to shout with joy, to, to serve with gladness, to sing with joy, to surrender, to submit, because God is God. He's good. He's the creator. He sits upon his throne. You can trust him. He's faithful. As Mark shared this morning about the four generations sitting around the table, you can see his past faithfulness in generations past. And it gives you this exuberance and this trust and this confidence for this generation and the generation to come. God's good. We're the sheep of his pasture. We're his people. So the psalmist invites us to shout, to serve, to sing, to surrender, to submit. And in verses four and verses five, the heart of this psalm, to be thankful, to, to think properly. Look at verse four where he says, enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. What's interesting about this song is he writes about God's people gathering together, entering his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. But there's this dynamic of community of God's people coming together in that mindset of praise and adoration that's peppered with thanksgiving. I mean, a personal relationship with Jesus is an absolute necessity but our walk with the Lord isn't just personal. There's also a community aspect to it. One author says this, that this psalm teaches that there's a special aspect of thanksgiving that involves the whole people of God together, not just in private prayers of individuals. Meaning this, that if you think you can walk with the Lord, just you, your Bible, and at the beach, you're missing out. You won't be able to walk with the Lord in this attitude of gratitude like you're intended to do because here he does tell us, enter his gates. There's this dynamic of God's people gathering together. And this is an important aspect of your relationship with the Lord. 
Gathering with God's people positions our walk with God to be in an atmosphere that rightly sets worship with thanksgiving and praise. I mean, it doesn't have to look like this, right? Like everyone's kind of watching Christmas movies right now. Like it's not this mindset that we all just sing, da, do, da. Like that's what brings it out of us, right? It's not that dynamic. But community in Christ is vital. Community challenges you to be more like Jesus. Hebrews chapter 10, the author writes this. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. Let us not neglect meeting together, as some do, but to encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Community challenges you to be more like Jesus. In community, your gifts and your talents are revealed. Ecclesiastes chapter four says this, two are better than one because their double is their strength and double the stamina and double the talents. This dynamic of within the context of community, you're given an opportunity to discover the gifts and talents that God has placed in you and to use them to bless others. You're not called to isolation, but called to community in thanksgiving. 1 Thessalonians shows us that community opens our eyes to the needs of others. Paul writes this in 1 Thessalonians 5. Brothers and sisters, we urge you to warn those who are lazy. Encourage those who are timid. Take tender care of those who are weak and be patient with everyone. You know, when you live in community, when you gather with God's people routinely and regularly, you look around and you see the needs of those around us. And community places us in this place of our heart and our lives where we can come out of self-centeredness, self-absorption by giving us the responsibility to look out and for one another. Community opens our eyes to the needs of others to the gifts and talents that God's placed in us. It, it challenges us to be more like Jesus. And an even community can carry us emotionally. So what do you mean by that? Galatians 6.2, Paul writes, share each other's burdens. And in this way, you're obeying the law of Christ. In community, you're given that opportunity, that responsibility to support to carry one another through the highs and the lows. And it's interesting, community actually sharpens and strengthens and empowers your own relationship with God. Proverbs 27, 17, as iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. When we're surrounded by other believers, it's like our faith ignites. Those embers grow warmer. And there's something powerful about believers routinely, consistently, rhythmically joining together, worshiping the Lord. It may not be like the who's around the Christmas tree, that kind of nostalgic men, uh, mindset there. But there's something about being in community that fosters thanksgiving. And there's something about isolation that kills it. And so the psalmist writes, enter into his gates and his courts with thanksgiving and praise. And this is what the psalmist is getting at. That our attitude of gratitude, as it were, is enhanced and platformed appropriately as we worship the Lord in community. So this morning... The psalmist invites us to shout and to serve, to sing, to submit, to surrender, to thankfulness together. And as he closes this psalm, it's just this reality that we're a thankful people because of who God is. Look at verse five as he encourages us to think properly together. For the Lord is good his unfailing love continues forever and his faithfulness continues to each generation. This is who God is. God is good. 
His love continues forever, his faithfulness to every generation. Why do we need to be called back to this over and over and over and again? Because whoever controls our minds controls the entirety of our life. And so God calls us to a place over and over and again in Scripture to thankfulness, to this perspective of who he is, a lifestyle that's surrendered and submitted to him, and to think rightly. And church, here is proper thinking. The Lord is inconsistent. You better get out there on your own and make it happen because no one's watching your back. No. Does anyone ever feel? Oh, we won't raise hands. But here is proper thinking. The Lord is good. The Lord is good. His unfailing love continues forever. And his faithfulness continues to each generation. Whoever controls your mind controls the entirety of your life. So think properly about that which is most important, who God is. You know, there's a passage in the book of Romans that one author wrote and often was quoted in saying this, that if your Bible were ever to just plop down on a table or on a chair, it should just open to Romans chapter 6, chapter 7, and chapter 8 because you read it so often. Why? Why? Because in the book of Romans, we're reminded and we're given such perfect clarity of what God has done in Jesus Christ. The book of Romans is the book that best explains the gospel above any other book in a way that Paul often does and kind of that step-by-step -step process. In Romans chapter 8, he says something to us about God's love. And I just want to read it to you. I want to read it over you. Paul writes this. What shall we say about such wonderful things as this? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one. For God himself has given us right standing with himself. Who then shall condemn us? No one. Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us and is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand pleading for us. And listen to what he says. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or persecuted or hungry or, or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? No, no. Despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loves us. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, angels nor demons, fears for today or worries for tomorrow. Not even powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above nor the earth below indeed. Nothing Nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Proper thinking is something that we're called to by the word of God over and over and over and again. And proper thinking leads to that thanksgiving, which leads to that life of surrendered and submission. So you feel like you want to sing with joy, serve with gladness, and shout with joy. Where does it start? I want to encourage you. Be in God's word. You know, it's interesting. In the book of Ephesians and Colossians, those are two New Testament passages that are often quoted about thanksgiving to thank God for all things and to thank God in all things. And if you follow those books after the author writes that to the church, he then begins to talk about thanksgiving and submission. That's where those relationship passages are about husband and wife, parent and child. But he talks about being in God's word and walking in his spirit in those two places. 
And as you're simply thinking properly by being in God's word, as you're walking in the spirit, obediently following the Lord, as he's called you to do, empowered by his spirit, that's what leads to thanksgiving. That's what leads to surrenderedness, submission, shouting with joy and singing with joy and serving with gladness. Proper thinking is this. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Proper thinking is this. For the Lord is good. His unfailing love continues forever and his faithfulness continues to each generation. Like I said this morning, kind of as we began our time together, it's interesting. As you kind of survey scripture, often God calls us to certain things over and over and over and again. The only time I can ever find anything about seagulls and bats is in Leviticus chapter 11, right? 19, somewhere in there. But thankfulness... A mindset to remember who God is, a lifestyle where you're surrendered to him that, that leads to shouting and singing with joy over and over and over and over and again, he calls us to that. So as we kind of just digest that turkey from Thursday, as we kind of get, you know, ready to step into all that is Christmas, I want to remind you this morning of who God is that he loves you, that his unfailing love continues forever. And I want to encourage you to shout, to sing, to serve with joy and gladness, to do that with God's people. There's something about gathering with God's people that fosters that attitude of gratitude, that mindset of thanksgiving appropriately, properly. And to know that God loves you, that you are the sheep of his pasture, that you belong in his fold, that he will never leave you nor forsake you. So sing to him, serve him, surrender to him, and walk in thanksgiving, walk in peace, walk in joy, because of who God is and his faithfulness to you and to me.